We just finished up an Evoke Therapy program. We just finished up our, our yearly conference. We call it FITS, Forum for Innovative Treatment Solutions, where we, we host professionals and we offer trainings and experiences for professionals. And this year's theme was attachment theory and attach, attachment theory, theory and how it informs us in our therapy. And I had chosen this topic, this topic of doing prior to, to this conference, but I, I can't tell you how well this, this is built out of that idea of attachment theory. The, the idea of joining is a technique to build a therapeutic alliance, to build trust, to encourage openness in your client. So I'll talk about that tonight. And I think there's some really interesting principles in this because I think for, for a lot of people, if they were to watch therapy in a lot of cases, the layperson, they wouldn't be able to see the magic of it because what they would be thinking of the entire time is when is the person going to be confronted? When is the person going to be taught? what they need to learn in this process. And, and they talk about constantly about this idea that, that joining is the, the glue that holds therapy together. But I think we might even go a little bit deeper as I talk tonight about the idea that it actually might be all of it or, or the most important part of it. I had this quote come to mind this morning when I woke up thinking about the conference. And, and it goes like this, don't fix your clients, find them. And then being found, they will heal. We know something about attachment trauma. We know something about attachment theory. We know that attachment may be the most important predictor in resilience and in mental health and wellness. And we know that because we come with attachment traumas and, and fractured attachments, that we will pass on some of those same processes, some of those same wounds. On the surface, we're not able to see them. On the surface, when we come to a child, trying to fix or, or help them. We, we think that's coming from a place of love. But there might be something more important and there might be something more healing about just listening to them, just connecting to them, just understanding them. So I'm going to talk about today, I'm going to talk about this idea of joining. I'm going to talk about what gets in the way of it. I'm going to talk about why we're resistant to it. I'm going to talk about what it looks like. We, we, you know, we talk about this in the field all the time with your children. When children first enter our program, a lot of times they focus on the differences between themselves and others. Sometimes that's, that's at the aim of trying to convince parents or others that they don't belong here. I think we do that sometimes when we walk into our own meetings. Joining asks us to find the commonalities. There's a famous story in a book that teaches about joining where a therapist, after meeting with a client several times, decided to refer the client on to somebody else, didn't feel like he could join, didn't feel like he could see himself in the other person. And during their first interview, the new therapist found out that the client was an artist, that that was one of their, their passions in life. And it occurred to this second therapist that there must have been some significant barrier because the first therapist was an artist also in their spare time. It was one of their, their hobbies at this point. Mental health is often indicated or, or an indication of mental health is can we see the similarities between ourselves and others? Can we look past the content, past the details, and, and see some of the, the root similarities? I told the story about working initially with sex offenders for the state of Utah about where I came in very confident, almost arrogant, in my approach, thinking, surely I'll be able to help these people because I'm better than they are. They're, they're more low functioning. They've done things that I've never done. They've harmed people in ways that I've never even considered. And after one half of an evening, by the end of that first evening and, and working with them and being trained, I was scared to death because I saw not only some similarities between myself and them at the core, at the root, but also in some ways, I saw that some of them were more courageous and more advanced in their work than I was, more honest and authentic in their disclosures and their sharing. So finding com commonalities takes strength. How much better off, and I talk about this with parents all the time, I, I can't emphasize this enough, how much better off would it be if you shared your struggles, your similarities, so much more than advice your children need to hear statements like, I know what it's like, I get it. I still struggle with some of that too. 
And why are we afraid to say that? Because we're afraid that they're going to use it against us. But that only comes from a zero-sum game model where there's a winner and a loser and everything adds up to zero. If we offer ourselves, if we surrender ourselves in this way, then there's no power struggle. There's no control. But, but it's scary because we've been conditioned that if we don't control things, somebody's going to get hurt. That conditioning started before our children in most cases. It was modeled by our parents. And for some of us growing up in, in more chaotic or, or, or anxious homes, we learned that if we weren't hypervigilant, that we or others were going to get hurt. And we, we raised our children with that same mentality. We call it love. We call it giving. We call it watching out for and, and while those motives are in us as loving parents, this process of joining, of understanding, of connecting, of building an alliance is something entirely altogether different. It's something that, that we, we do in this, this surrender of power and control. We learn to relate. We learn to relate as therapists. You know, new therapists are very wary of self-disclosure and self-disclosure, and in some ways, I, I think that might be wise because many young therapists haven't participated enough in their own therapy to, to be consciously and intentionally using self-disclosure to model and to join. They might be inadvertently asking the client to take care of them. But when therapists often get more experience, they become comfortable with self-disclosure. And you don't have to be specific with all the details. You can tell stories or examples. You can relate to the principles or the concepts or the feelings that someone is experiencing without telling every detail. We, we offer empathy and validation. Again, maybe more than just the glue. That might be the beginning and the end of therapy. If we go back to my first quote about being found, is the healing thing. What we know about the brain, what we know about brain circuitry, what we know about attachment, is that therapy ideally, and the therapeutic work that you families do, creates a reparative experience, a, a rebound experience. We begin to rewire the child's brain, or our brain if we're the ones in therapy. We, we develop what's called learned attachment or earned attachment. So this, this empathy and validation gives somebody a sense that they are okay. And when they know they are okay, they don't have to prove themselves to anyone else, right? That's where the defensiveness goes down. I say this all the time. I think this applies as parents. I think we think a lot about how much we trust our children or how much we trust our clients. But do we think enough about how much our clients and our children trust us. So empathy and validation become the, the, the soil, if you will. I ask our therapists, I ask our, I ask our staff, when I teach therapists, I ask them, I plead with them to hold on to your techniques. Hold on to your theories lightly. And spend as much energy, as much focus as you can and understanding and validating the individual so that they will feel safe to come out from behind their armor, from behind their defenses. Listening is the operationalization of joining. I, I get asked, as much as anything, as much as any question I get asked, it is what would you say to your client? What would you say to your child? And my response is much, much more important than what you say is your ability to listen to them. Because rebellion, because acting out, we listened to Dr. Gabor Mate yesterday or two days ago at our conference. Acting out is, is a kind of a, a last resort. If I can't be heard, then I act it out. So the better we are at listening, the, the better that we can develop our ears and our eyes, to see and to hear our children, the less they will need to act it out. There's an idea with, with joining called the immovable object. And 
what this is is this idea that you still show up authentically. You still show up with a boundary. I think sometimes people compromise themselves in an effort to join. Sometimes parents can be vulnerable to persuasion to get off of their center because they think that that's going to earn trust. Think about a substitute teacher or a teacher for that matter growing up. Some of you, most of you, I imagine almost all of you knew that teacher who started off very, very tough, very clear. But by the end of the term, by the end of the, the semester or the year, you found them to be your favorite teacher. That's because they presented with what Mnuchin called the immovable object. Salvador Mnuchin was an author who spoke a lot about joining. And he talked about when he would come into the room with a client, or especially in the, in, in, with an adolescent or a child, that there were some things that were not negotiable for him. And those were his authentic, the important things about him. And, and so we don't let our empathy rob us. There are things that we can't... I talk all the time about saying to your child, what, what can I do to help you? What can I do to support you? What do you need from me? That doesn't mean that anything they ask for, you can or will do. Your, your response to some of those things could be, I, I can't do that and feel okay. And then the same is true in therapy as it is in parenting or in any relationship. So it is okay to come in with integrity, to come in with, uh, with your authenticity, to come in with healthy self-care, healthy boundaries. Can you confront? We, we know from, from, from the research, if you want to read the book, Motivational Interviewing, or reference the book Motivational Interviewing. They talk about the research in there. We know from the research that head-to-head -head confrontation, provocative confrontation, often elicits more defensiveness. It, it, you can be creative. The, the more I'm trusted, the more I'm let in, the more I can challenge because, this is important, the child knows that it comes purely or nearly purely from a place of love. But if it's coming from a place of my anxiety or fear, my anger or frustration, then it's not for you, the client, it's for me. And children can sense that a mile away. And they can sense when I'm doing it for me or for you. And that takes a lot of work to constantly discover that. So, so when they talk about motivational interviewing, when they talk about confrontation, they talk about identifying discrepancies. The skill set I often encourage people to use is, I have a thought or an idea. What if this? What if that? It's less threatening. It's less authoritarian. And, and it's not demanding that the person cooperate or, or go along with my idea. And therefore, it's less threatening. And they can reject it just as easily. So confrontation must be nested for it to be effective, effective in, in a foundation of love. Um, ideally, it's, it's not a lot of energy, not a lot of intensity. It's not to try to force. And again, I, I think talking about in the beginning here, this idea of confrontation and joining, I think a lot of lay people, if they were to watch and observe through closed-circuit TV to, to, or videotape to watch a therapist, a master therapist doing their work, sometimes they wouldn't see it because they would, they would think that the therapist isn't getting it or, or, or doesn't have the courage to confront the client. Like I've said many times, that, that, that is not only ineffective, and the research tells us that, but it doesn't take a lot of skill. Any lay person can do that. Most of the stuff that most of our clients present with, that be it you know, the children in a family or the parents in the family, most people with very little training can identify thinking errors, pathology, problems, symptoms, diagnoses. There's not a, a whole lot of talent in that. But this skill set, this idea of joining, of, of holding the defense, of honoring it, of, of, of valuing it, of listening to it, that takes 
a special kind of skill. And that's why we talk to you about a, a reflective listening. That's why we spend so much time explaining to you your child. A, a lot of the clients that I've worked with over the years, you know, that's how it goes. They'll come to me with a behavior of their child and say, help me understand what's going on. And I do my best to try to explain it. So the parent can say, ah, I see now. Now, now what does this tell us about how we might respond most effectively? Right? That, that's the kind of the essence of the process. Does your empathy paralyze you? I think sometimes people think when they, they, they come to this conclusion that if I understand where you're coming from, I can't set a healthy boundary. I can't assert myself. And if your empathy robs you of your boundaries, then it's out of balance. Most of the time when your empathy robs you, it's because of guilt and shame. It's because I don't have the right to hold a boundary because I'm so immersed in my child's struggle. Let's say that you were divorced or you worked a lot or you had mar marital conflict. Even, even if your child was put up for adoption before you adopted them, right? All of those kinds of things can hold you hostage. But it's, you're allowed to. It's okay to set boundaries. I think for some parents, part of where they, they, they start off with in our program is from a place of anger. And, and while anger can be effective at getting us started, it can be the, the impetus for change. It doesn't necessarily sustain us. We have to learn as parents, as people in relationship, to be consistent with our boundaries past the point of anger or when there's not anger, to be effective in relationships and healthy relationships and developing healthy relationships. Like I said, validation leads to breakthroughs because the person feels safe. They let, let walls down. They tend to be more honest and self-disclosing. They trust you. They don't feel like they're the identified patient or the project or the only one who's a screw-up in the family. Much, much more important than you giving them your little anecdotes or lecture, lectures is you sharing with them, I still struggle with peer pressure. I, this weekend when I was facilitating a couple of pieces of work, the, the most impactful moment came up for me when I, when I self-disclosed some ridiculous thing that I had done and somebody came up afterwards and said, it made me feel so, this is a professional colleague of mine, it made me feel so safe. I didn't feel alone. When you can't see similarities, there's a blockage there. Right? There's some limitation. It's usually because of shame. It's usually because we have to see ourselves as good. Better than. So if you're finding yourself painting somebody with one brush, one color, that's when you go back and do your work. Why can't I see the similarities? We do a lot of exercises in, in the field and in the intensives where we ask people to share how they relate to others. And you can see as people go through the work and progress, they start to relate more. A lot of parents say, what if my child is with people who use drugs or with people who don't use drugs or whatever the diagnosis, whatever the question is. And what we know, what we see is the further along in the program that, that our clients, our students get, they turn to the student, to the client sitting next to them, and they say, you know what? I didn't use drugs, but my drug of choice was lying. Or eating. Or anger. I didn't steal from my grandmother, but I did lie and hurt my family. Very similarly to the way that you did. Even though the behavior was different. That's what it sounds like. And... and if peers can do that, then why can't parents do it? Allowing them to access their resources, meaning that you can hold a boundary. You can let them struggle. You can let them go through pain and find access to the resources that they have hidden. That when we step in too early or walk on eggshells, invalidating ourselves in the hope that we can somehow push the right buttons or get them... To, to X, Y, or Z place. They don't have to access the resources. This really is a lot of what it fosters anxiety in families. 
is the removal of, of the difficulty before the, the individual has to break through it. That's why so much for anxiety disorders, so, so much of the, the, the training is about desensitization, exposure therapy. I was talking with a mother this morning who's considering the program about this idea that, you know, about her, her son's phobias and fears. And phobias was probably j just a, a way to, to describe the extraordinary anxiety that he had. But that's how we get through it. When I talk to people who struggle with anxiety and panic attacks, you know, part of what gets in the way of that, that healing is that we try to remove them from, from the situation, right? And it's okay just to sit with them, as long as we know they're physically safe, and to embrace it, to run with it. Being nice to get gratitude my end. I think all of us have, at times, done it for that reason. I'm going to be nice to you. I'm going to give you extra. Kind of a, kind of a bribery system. There's a great little book that I read when I was a teenager called The One Minute Manager. Some of you may have read it. It talks about a, a healthy management style. It's a very thin book and has some great story. And one of the stories that I'll never forget, I think I read it when I was 15, was the story of these two emperors in China that, that, that ruled back to back. And the first emperor was started his reign absolutely generous and nice and kind to his people but didn't have a lot of boundaries, a lot of fall through, a lot of consistency. And eventually had to kind of ramp up that, that, that tough side of him, that, that consistent boundary side. And he ended, when he died, that he was very hated, disliked by his people. Conversely, another emperor started off strict and tough with his people and then loosened up as he went along. And that emperor died loved and revered. So, so the anecdote, like the teacher story that I told you is, it's, it's okay. You don't have to punch somebody in the nose about it, but you show up with your boundaries. That, that's, that's, again, allowing them to access their resources. I think new staff that we train tend to want to get that buy-in by being extra nice, and then they end up having to backpedal. What are the barriers? Why are we afraid to validate? Like I said, we're afraid of losing control. We're afraid that if we validate something, that we're endorsing it, that we're allowing it. I, I can remember one simple story, and I've, it's a very simple story that, that I've told several times. My, my daughter, my youngest daughter, asked a year or two ago, can, can the dog play on the couch? We have a big, had a big Rottweiler at the time. She's since passed. He's since passed on. Can, can Coda play on the couch? And I said, no, Coda can't. He's not allowed on the couch. And she said something along the lines of, that's not fair. And I said, I know, right? And she said, so he can? And I said, no. And she said, oh, okay. So even that example illustrates that when I said, I understand, and yes, it's not fair, that she interpreted it to mean that he can. And so that's, why, that's where that fear comes from. We feel like we have to judge it or, or lecture about it or teach about it to make our point. Why are we resistant to understand? I've, I've told this before. W when you say, I don't understand my child regarding a, a, a certain kind of behavior, that's okay. And then we explain it to you. But to persistently, consistently take the stance of, I don't understand, one of two things is happening. Either you're, you're, you're so well defended that you can't see self in, in an other, right? You're making this kind of literal translation. In the, in the movie Finding Joe, they talk about this idea about being metaphorically impaired, right? not seeing the, the big pieces. So you're either very well defended, number one, or you're using that statement, I don't understand, as a shaming statement. Like, you, you're so crazy, you're so insane, so broken, so whatever. You're beyond all reason, all capacity to understand. You know, it, it, the more open we are, the more capable we are, we can understand everything. We don't like it. it. It might scare us to understand it. That's why I walked out of that first night after working with sex, sex offenders so terrified. To see myself, 
in them, as you might imagine, was terrifying. Of course, over time and with practice, I can see myself in the depressed individual, the sex offender, the drug addict, the anxious, the oppositional defiant. I can see myself in all populations. You know, be authentic. And being authentic doesn't mean all self-disclosing. I think sometimes parents mistake this idea that being authentic means you have to tell everything. And forgive the analogy, but I've, I've given this before. My wife and I have a private life, right? Our intimacy is private. I don't share it with my children or with anybody for that matter. But that's not lying. And that's not inauthentic. That's just a healthy boundary, an appropriate boundary. Be, be humble. I, I, you know, the, the, the wise therapist is as proud of themselves for what they don't know. They pride themselves in not knowing, on constantly being curious and asking questions and learning, discovering. Also, they don't set themselves up above the client as an expert on that parent's life. The way that my therapist says it is she says, you do not know your child's truth. You do not know their path. And again, this does not invite a passive level of parenting. It invites a different kind of parenting for sure, but it's not passive. You take on the responsibility for your own journey and how you show up in relationship. That's very powerful and very assertive. But you don't know somebody else's truth. And learning, of course, I talk about this in my book a lot, learning to ask yourself your intention. I told the story about a parent years ago in a New York parent meeting. She asked the question. I've had this question asked to me many times. Would it be okay? Would it be any circumstance where it would be appropriate to tell my child the financial sacrifice that we're making for this program, how expensive it is specifically? And before I could even answer the question, a parent from a row behind her said, why would you tell them that? There was a pause. This parent in the front row looked down. And she recognized it would be because I would be trying to guilt him, to control him. So she answered her own question. Hold on to theory and technique lightly. Hold on to your lectures, your wisdom, lightly. The number one most highlighted line in my, my book when I go on Kindle is the line about pack your lectures away. Spend first and foremost and maybe even last listening. I said earlier, not seeing the magic of therapy. If you thought an, empath an empathic therapist, you might not think they were getting it. But, but that's how we do it. That's how we facilitate change, is we have a different kind of response than the, than the previous context. And that response changes the wiring in the brain. We can see it, folks. We can see it on, F on, on functional MRIs. We know that this kind of empathic joining technique response, we know it changes brains. It causes resiliency, response flexibility. It allows for, for the brain to think in its, its higher level instead of from a fight or flight or freeze lower brain area. Right? It changes all of that. Honoring the defense is one way to talk about this idea. The defense has so much to tell us. The symptom has so much to tell us. We follow the, the symptom as, as a trail of crumbs back to find out what's going on. Dr. Gabor Mate said at his talk this weekend at our conference, remember, addiction isn't the disease. It's not the problem. It's the addict's solution to the problem. Right? Drugs are the solution to the problem for the addict. The problem is the pain, the anxiety, the stress, the loss, the grief, the sadness. That's the problem in, in the individual's line, mind. Not the cutting, not the depression, not the panic attack, not the school refusal, but it's what's underneath that. Not the temper tantrum, but what's underneath that. So we learn to have a greater capacity. We learn to develop greater bandwidth. We do it through education. We do it because we practice self-care, because we go to places like therapy and Al-Anon and Codependence Anonymous and Families Anonymous to be heard, to listen. We educate ourselves. And all of this builds greater bandwidth. I had a friend say to me recently, 
you know, watching the, the current political climate must be very difficult for you. Having being trained as a mental health professional, you must be especially upset by it all the time. And and I stopped and I said, that's not how it works. Having more information, if that's all I was doing was I had more information in education, yeah, right. It would be more annoying. But because therapy is developing more compassion, understanding, curiosity, seeing the commonalities, understanding the other, ideally, I have actually more patience. I'm less traumatized by what's going on in our society. It's not effortless by any means, but, but to the extent that I'm really developing the, the core skills, the core sensibilities of a therapist, I have more patience for the process. And again, more patience doesn't mean passive. It just means less reactive, less hate, less angst, less discouragement, less pain. Countertransference and what it is telling you. you know, my reaction, countertransference is how I feel toward the client. Is that something about me? Is it diagnostic? You know, Sigmund Freud said in the early days of therapists that essentially countertransference was to be avoided. More modern interpretations of countertransference are, I'm having a feeling. What does that tell me about the client? What does that tell me about myself? That's why I still go to therapy. Uh, probably 25, 35% of my therapy sessions are my working out cases. And I'm not looking for solutions and answers. I'm looking for why am I stuck? Why am I anxious? Why am I frustrated or exhausted? Why am I feeling inadequate? in this therapeutic relationship so I can sort out what's mine and what's yours and, and then I the more clear I can get about me the more clearly I can lead myself or, or be led to where the client is at and remember the number one most important predictor of providing healthy attachment is, is healing and grieving your own attachment trauma your own attachment fractures and all of us have it to a greater or lesser extent. Part of our job as therapists, part of our job as parents, is to find their story. One of the questions that kept getting asked by the experts this week in speaking at our conference on attachment was, but how does it apply in this situation? What if there are two fathers? What if there's only one parent? Well, how does it apply to an educational consultant or a teacher? And, and, and over and over again, the experts were saying it's, it's, it's extraordinarily similar. Obviously, the impact of a parent is more significant than a teacher or a therapist, but the same principles apply. And the idea is we, we learn to hear their story. We don't rush in with solutions or answers or opinions or judgments. We learn to see the world. It's called mentalizing. We see the world through the client's eyes, no matter how crazy it sounds. We understand the crazy. We find out how it makes sense in some context. We try to reflect it back to the child, to the client. We try to understand what that story is asking of us. And when we find ourselves frustrated, exhausted, we recharge. When we find ourselves frustrated or exhausted or or exasperated or disgusted or terrified. We recognize that we've lost contact with the client, with the child, and we go to great recharge, so we increase our bandwidth. Provoking defenses and power struggle, you know, this, this is the opposite. This is what we're trying not to do. And so much of the solutions, you know, therapists hide behind diagnostics and their education and language. Parents imagine themselves, because they're more functioning, their defenses are, are more developed, because they don't have the same symptomology of their children, they imagine themselves better than their children. And the children can feel that. It becomes our job to understand our children. It becomes our job to to, to see the world through their eyes. Concurrently, it's our job to take care of ourselves and to practice healthy self-care and boundaries, but it is our job to understand them. 
I don't get them. I don't get why they do it. And it's okay if you say that, if you think that, if you feel that. That's why you have a therapist. That's why you have people helping you. But that is our job. Allowing our children to be disagreeable, to feel disagreeable towards us. Just talking to that parent who was inquiring today about this idea that we don't ask our children to take care of our esteem. It's, it's, I see it all the time about parents being upset that their children aren't grateful for them, that their children don't acknowledge them, that their children aren't, don't appreciate them. And my thought is we don't do this thing called parenting for those things. It's not our child's job. Now, if I'm working with the child and the child doesn't have appreciation, doesn't really, isn't grateful for the parent, I might, again, find them and find out where they're hurt, but it's not their job to take care of us. And it's not like I've never felt that. There's times when I've wanted to be acknowledged by my child, but that's not their job. And that's none of my business. And that's ideally not why I do what I do for them. Let your child be confused. Don't have to give them all the answers. Even when I ask questions, my therapist doesn't jump right in. I was talking to a therapist at this conference this weekend, and, and, and a client came in with, with this idea that, that, that they asked him, they said, if I don't have any memory of trauma, because it happened before I could codify it with words, pre-verbal, non-verbal, could it still impact me? And I was telling the therapist, don't you wish everybody would ask that? You know, th this client had some sense of it, some sense that, that was there. He could see the evidence of the trauma. He just couldn't remember the trauma. And the therapist said, I had to kind of slow down. Right? It's exciting to want to pre provide that, that but, but it's okay to let them struggle. We want to provide that answer, but it's okay to let them struggle. Let them work their way through it. I, I've set, talked about this for years. I find myself, I have found myself getting angry or frustrated with my adolescent and young adult children for not getting it. And, and, and it's hard not to smile when I say that. That, that. That's me wishing that they get it so I don't have to follow through with a boundary. So I don't have to be the bad guy. Because it's my ego. Because I need to be the good guy. Because I need to be liked. It's okay that they don't get it. See, that's not our, our worry, our concern in life. With all of our relationships, they don't get it. They can't treat me this way as one of the ways this is said. Well, yes, they can until they can't. Until you don't allow it. I was talking to a, to a mother this week who was saying, they've come to the place where they said, you, you just are you're out of the house if you treat it this way. And this was even with an underage, with a 17-year-old child. Trying to control them, I feel safe to try to control them, to use intimidation, coercion, shame. Doesn't have long-lasting benefits, of course. But that makes us feel safe. Right? If we control that which is outside of us, then we don't have to manage our own anxiety. We don't have to own it. That's where that comes from. And again, that comes from our own attachment trauma. It was passed on to us in very similar ways. Um, so what do you own? You own your reaction. You own your feeling. You own your responsibility. You own your story. You don't own how they think and feel about you. You listen. You, you let it inform you. But it doesn't tell you about you. It tells you about them. Like my professor said in, during my master's program, what you think about the devil tells me more about you than it does about the devil. Same in similar ways about God. What you tell me about angels or God tells me more about you than it does about God or angels. So when we take on the project of our own differentiation, as Gandhi says, we set ourselves up in a situation to love and see other as other. And that's work. And that's work on this project. This is an old webinar that I took from some old slides, and I added this, this on here because it's a, um, it's a reminder to not look at simple cause and effect, that this is complicated. That, that, that we look at our intention, our origin, where we're coming from, what we want, and that we don't take on the effect. Because if we do, I mean, if we do that too simply, too immediately, 
then, our, then others learn to control us. Children learn to control us. We have an adult filter. Yes, if our child is afraid of us, we look at what we might have done to intimidate or to scare them. But if our child gets angry at us and we have this, this kind of differentiation that Gandhi talks about, we just learn to find them and to see them because we're not in doubt with ourselves. This is where I get stuck. One parent asks, this is for questions. If my son expresses behaviors or thoughts that I don't agree with, I feel that I don't, if I don't say something about it, my child might, uh, might think that I'm condoning it. This generally leads to an argument. Even if I validate it, I feel like he's thinking I'm okay with it. Of course, that's very, very common. You can just disagree with it. I get it, but it's not for me. It's, it's magic, really. It's magic because oftentimes when you understand where it's coming from, I understand it, where the sex offenders were coming from. By no means that I condone their behavior. I understand when people are violent. By no means do I condone the behavior. So the, there's a bit of there's a piece of this about control and, and about history. I gave you the example with my daughter and the dog on the couch. Right? There was enough history in our family that validating led to some kind of equivocation on boundaries, on rules that she interpreted. So over time, they'll learn it. I've seen this with children. I've seen this with children in the field now for decades in the wilderness. They come to me and they say, I have a request. And I say, thank you. You know, one of the things I say to, to children when they tell me I don't understand them, and I said, how can I demonstrate to you that I understand you short of agreeing with you and giving you what you want? Right? That, that's the power struggle. You don't understand me. Well, I, so I asked that question. How can I show you that I understand you? If the only way that I can show you that I understand you is to give you what you want, we might be at a standoff here. That's where you, you do lose your center. So there's a retraining that goes on in this communication model and learning to listen, to, to share empathy. And over time, it builds a, 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 you, you refortify the soil to, to grow new and wonderful vegetation. But it takes a while. And we can learn to change our communication in such a way that, that, that validation doesn't mean condoning or allowing certain behavior to occur, occur, occur in our relationships in our house. But we don't come from a place of judgment or fear or intimidation. Somebody's asking the question, is this the webinar? Uh, is this going to be available to view later? I joined late and missed the first 17 minutes. Thanks. Yes. All of our webinars are available to join, to, to watch later. We post them in the next day or so. Also, we post them on our podcast app. So within the first 24 hours, we try to. They go to our podcast, and you can listen to them there. You can download them on your, any of your devices, and you can listen to them when you don't have connectivity. So the answer to that is yes. All right, let's go to some upcoming announcements. I'll stop for questions again at the end. We want all current parents to go to six of these 12-step support groups. Al-Anon, go to alanon.org, coda.org, familiesanonymous.org, <clears throat> naranon.org, and alateen is for teenagers, for children. You can also go to nami.org, n-a-m-i.org, for resources, free classes, education. Like I was just mentioning, if you go to the podcast app on your iOS device and you search Evoke Therapy Programs, you can download or listen to over 100 of our podcasts and new ones each week. If you have an Android device, you can download the SoundCloud app and do the same search, Evoke Therapy Programs, and listen to our podcast there. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Evoke Therapy on Facebook at Evoke Therapy Programs. You can go to the Second Nature Alumni Foundation on Facebook. That's an organization that's set up for people who can't afford therapy. Um, go to our, our blog to look at recent articles. My book, The Journey of the Heroic Parent, is available on Amazon or barnesandnoble.com. It's also available on Audible or for CD purchase. Go to the Parent Alumni Foundation book page to buy my book or any of the books recommended by our therapists. And a percentage of the proceeds 
goes to the charity to help people who can't afford therapy. I'm going to be in Orange County this Wednesday, the 26th, 6.30 to 8.30 at Fusion Academy. It's a, it's a conjoint session with the Fusion Academy folks and the Evoke and, uh, folks. I'll be in New York on May 3rd next week at CUNY, as usual, from 6.30 to 8.30. I'll be in Seattle on May 17th, Chicago on May 23rd, and New York on June 7th. Upcoming intensives and workshops, the Finding You is full, April 28th is full, but the next one, I've actually done this over um, Memorial Weekend as a, an opportunity for people who can't do it because of work. So if you have more questions about our intensives, Finding You or Finding Family, please go to our website or you can, you can email intensives at evoketherapy.com. Upcoming workshops, we want all current families that possibly can to attend our workshops. The next one is at Entrada, May 27th and 28th. Contact Gail at evoketherapy.com for more questions. Pursuits are our high adventure programs, uh, camping, hiking, fly fishing, river rafting, canyoneering, international trips for young adults or for families. All right, before I, I close, any more questions? Concerning boundaries and attachment, one parent asks, I know the basic foundation of my son in my relationship is from early attachment issues. So it is difficult to hold boundaries due to my guilt. However, just this past week, my son was in town for, break, for a break from boarding school. I told him, uh, let me read this. Um, I told him he could not stay with me and if he was not sober. Therefore, I needed to, him to submit to a drug, scene, a drug screen. This totally shocked him. He said I was insane. How could I not let him stay with me without taking a drug screen? It was so hard. Had to feel my guilt and still do the right thing. Thank goodness I had my therapist in Utah to help me process. Thank you for speaking, for repeating the need to keep our boundaries. Uh, waiting to see how things turned out. Wonderful, wonderful story. Thank you for sharing it. It's difficult work. All right, folks, the next webinar, uh, there, there might be one more question count that's coming in. My daughter was at Evoke in Trotta for 12 weeks and is now in her eighth month of therapeutic boarding school. Our last discussion, when listening to her battles, she said, you guys are so loving, it's easier when you are angry and disappointed. I don't know what to do with this anymore. This webinar content is so timely. I'm starting to realize that being detached from her struggles doesn't mean I am not empathic and loving towards what she is going through. Thank you. I love that story. Thank you so much. The research is there. I mean, this, is not, this is not just theory. This is not just one person's opinion. Attachment is the foundation of most of what we want for our children and our own impaired attachment from our childhood. And by the way, it came from our grandparents, right? Um, so it gets passed down. There's no blame in this. It's just human. So we work on it. There's a question that came up. Where is Entrada? Entrada is our Southern Utah program. So we have an Oregon program, Central Oregon, and Southern Utah. Uh, I have a parent asking the question, can siblings, 13-year-old brother, come to the OC meeting with you this Wednesday? I don't think they would be interested in it. I, I'd be okay if they want to sit and listen to adults talk about boundaries and therapy for an hour and a half, two hours. I don't imagine that. I wouldn't ask them not to come, but my guess is they wouldn't be interested in it. So that's my answer. All right, folks, I have one more webinar this week. It's going to be on dialectical behavioral therapy. It's a hot new therapy, evidence-based therapy that helps with severe uh, diagnoses, uh, mood disorders, uh, unstable, unstable, excuse me, behavior sexually acting out, dangerous behaviors. Um, so I'll be talking and teaching that. A lot of our, our students are really drawn toward it. That's going to be this Thursday, the 27th. At 7 p.m. Mountain Time, I'll be moving personally this week over the next two weeks. So might be in a hotel, uh, might be still here in this office. But in the next couple of weeks, there's definitely going to be some different backgrounds for those of you watching on the webinar. Thank you, folks. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for your comments, for your questions. Have a, a great couple of days, and I'll talk to you Thursday night. Take care. Bye-bye.